No one, actually. CZTS, CIGS, probably Cadmium Theroid also, and also Raman characterization. So you will give a talk tomorrow also on Raman characterization. But today, let's stay on this overview on thinking TV technologies for about one hour. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, for the introduction. So I will speak today about this family of compounds that are all of them uh, included in uh, the type of devices that we called thin film photovoltaics. So just I will give a brief introduction about my institution, sorry for that, but it's a bit of lobby about my, my institution and myself. So we are a relatively small research center located in Barcelona. Our official name is the Catalonia Institute for Energy Research and we are 120 people more or less between scientists and administrators and so on. And my laboratory that is the Solar Energy Material and System Laboratory becomes one of the two departments we have in our institute that is advanced materials for energy. But in my institute there are also activities for research in uh, energy storage and harvesting, nanoionics and fuel cells, power systems and so on. So if you see some possibility for collaboration with other colleagues in my institution, for sure we will be very happy to give you details for contacting them. So in terms of our department, that is the Solar Energy Materials and System, is split in two groups. One group that is mainly dedicated to thin film chalcogenides, synthesis and devices, fabrication and characterization, and one group for advanced characterization that our main uh, characterization uh, uh, technique is uh, Raman spectroscopy that I will speak tomorrow. And concerning myself, this is in brief my history. I was born in, in Uruguay and I did my chemical engineering degree there, then a master thesis between Uruguay and Brazil, then I moved to Madrid, to Spain, and I did my PhD thesis in Madrid, working all this time in catalurite and related materials. After my thesis I moved to France during three years working in SAGES and then finally in 2010 I joined IREC in Barcelona working mainly in emerging thin film photovoltaic technology. So during my career I worked at first in catalurite, then in SAGES, then in emerging materials together with SAGES and these are the project that I coordinated during my whole life, including Hess cell, infinite cell, and star cell that are um, based on Kesterite, and this new project, Sensate, that is mainly for uh, new emerging low dimensional materials that I will present very briefly at the end. So, you learn a lot during this day about fundamentals of photovoltaic materials. The bad news here is that thin film photovoltaics are anything but not ideal, perfect or a standard. So all these equations and models that you learn, normally we have to push a lot to include our materials there or modify all this theory to include uh, the thin film photovoltaic technologies. So normally during this hour, the words ideal, perfect, and standard will be fully forbidden because you will see how complex can be all this material. And I think that it's very interesting to start to approach these technologies from the Disney point of view. <laughs> this is very important because you will understand that one of these, the film from Disney, The Beauty and the Beast, explain very well how we are there. Because basically in the beauty of and the best, silicon is of course the beauty, <laughs> and we are the best, the beast. <laughs> but if you work a lot, if you work really a lot and hard, then you can convert thin films in this handsome guy that uh, is the perfect partner for our beauty for silicon. So, and this is the magic of 
thin film photovoltaic technologies that being the beast can be converted into a handsome partner for silicon until Kesterite, of course, that we go back again to be the beast with the Kesterite. <laughs> so this is the introduction of my talk. Then I will review the importance of this thin film photovoltaic technologies. Why, if we have silicon, that is a really very nice and beautiful technology, we need the thin film photovoltaics. Some generalities about them. And then I will review three of the main technologies developed until now. Cartelluri, CJS, Kesterite, and a bit beyond this Kesterite. And I will sum up all the possible conclusions with these materials. So to put you in context, a typical silicon solar cell have around 300 microns. There are some technologies that are reducing the thickness. Uh, but it's around this 100 of microns, the thickness that the people has to use for preparing an efficient silicon solar cell. If we compare, ah, sorry, the presentation is with a human hair, this is the comparison that is much thicker than a human hair. Nevertheless, a thin thin solar cell is this, like this, is around one to five microns. So the thickness is much smaller than a human hair and much, much smaller than the uh, silicon solar cell. This is a magnification in order to see the structure. So one of the main advantage of thin film solar cell is that they allow for a very intensive use of material. With very tiny quantities of material, you can have the same effect that 300 micron of silicon. For example, normally in a typical uh, Thin film photovoltaic solar panel, there are between 4 to 10 grams of materials inside. And it's 120 meters by 1 meter, more or less. Then we can classify the photovoltaic technologies among three generations. This is one of the possible classification. The first generation is the generation, the first one that, of course, uh, comes on time, that is uh, silicon, related silicon, and you have monocrystalline and polycrystalline silicon. Then the second generation is thin film photovoltaic technologies, where these are the three main members of this family. And finally, all related to emerging photovoltaics, sometimes science fiction photovoltaic in the future, okay, that you can include several different materials, but also concepts. And today I will mainly explain you and give you details about this family of material, that is the family of material that I have investigated almost all my scientific life. This is some comparison between silicon and some of these thin film photovoltaic technologies. In terms of efficiency, uh, efficiency, sorry, some of them have achieved efficiencies comparable to crystalline silicon. Uh, in terms of module efficiency as well, it's quite similar. So in terms of efficiency, these are competitive with silicon. In terms of uh, commercial module efficiency, uh, if we consider monocrystalline silicon as really very high, the others are quite relatively lower, but still very competitive with, with silicon. And in the terms of global production, more or less, thin film represents today 7% of all the photovoltaic production in the world. And this is one of the main advantages also of thin film photovoltaic technology that I will go a bit deeper afterward. is the energy payback time that is much lower than in the case of silicon. So there are some characteristics that are comparable to silicon and some advantage with respect to silicon that I will highlight very soon. If we take a look to this very famous efficient, uh, efficiency gun chart that produced by Enrel that you will see, I think, this week several times, once again, there are some thin film photovoltaic technologies here in green that are among the highest in, uh, in, uh, that we, we have uh, for the production of uh, photovoltaic energy. So this also highlights 
the importance of these technologies in terms of uh, total efficiency. In terms of production and cost, one of the most important things, and thanks to this characteristic that uh, can be produced at relatively low temperature and also with a really very tiny quantities of material, the price of a module of a thin film technology like Cartelluri or SAGES is almost comparable, a bit higher, but not too much with respect to silicon. But considering the scale-up factor that we are probably two orders of magnitude, we have two orders of magnitude lower production than silicon, this is really very impressive because the scale-up factor will allow to really go below the price of silicon in the future. And this is another advantage, the payback time. So this is basically the definition of payback time is the time that is required to recover the energy that we spent in producing the PV module. Okay, so for producing a silicon module or a thin film module, you need to, of course, spend energy. So the time that you need this module producing energy in order to compensate the energy that we use to produce it is called the payback time. And the payback time of uh, thin film photovoltaic technology is uh, markedly lower than silicon. So this means that uh, in one or one and a half year you start to really win energy to with this kind of uh, uh, modules, but with silicon you need around two to one and a half years. These are the three main thin film photovoltaic technologies. Amorphous silicon, cadmium telluride and copper indium gallium disseminate. These are the structure of all of them that we will review after war. And Basically, some characteristic of all of them in amorphous silicon is a very low cost technology, really, extremely low cost, and using only earth abundant elements. But the main problem of this technology is the instability, it's not uh, stable with time, and medium efficiencies demonstrated and for quite complex devices with multi junction. So, normally, right now, amorphous silicon, there are some activities, but it's probably the material in this family that is studied in less extent when compared with the other. Cadmium telluride is a beautiful technology with a very high efficiency, with l very low cost demonstrated. The main problem is that tellurium is a scarce element and cadmium is toxic and contaminant, of course. And for SAGES, very high efficiency is demonstrated, relatively low cost as well, but main problem is indium and gallium that are also scarce elements. So are quite expensive element to use in this type of technology. There are two possible configuration of a thin film solar cell. What we call super straight, uh, sorry, here is a mistake, is this is substrate, okay? When we use super straight configuration, in the super straight configuration, so in a thin film solar cell, we always need a substrate. Because of course, if you are speaking about one, two microns of material, it's mechanically fully unstable. So you need to support this very thin layer on top of uh, some uh, mechanically robust substrate. The universal one is, uh, of course, glass. So if you illuminate your device from this substrate, then you are in the super straight case. And this is normally used when the PN junction is easy to be formed and non-sensitive to contamination of temperature. And with absorber with a high work function that require very specific ohmic contact. The advantage of this configuration is that the freedom to choose a metallic contact here, because normally here you have the substrate, here the n-type semiconductor, then the p-type semiconductor, and then the uh, top contact that in that case is uh, a metal. E and the p-n junction is much better protected because it's varied in all this structure. The disadvantage is you have few choices for absorber-buffer combination because required to withstand 
all the temperatures and processing steps to synthesize the absorber material. In the substrate, remember, we first fabricate the N-type semiconductor and then the P-type absorber. And normally for the P-type absorber you need at least 500 degrees. So this requires that the N-type semiconductor survive or withstand 500 degrees at least. The disadvantage is that, uh, uh, one as again, that you have few combinations of buffer and uh, absorber and you need, of course, highly transparent substrate because you are illuminating from the substrate. So it's non-compatible with opaque substrate. Sub substrate configuration is when you illuminate from the top of the solar cell, from the opposite side of your substrate. This is much better when your PN junction is sensitive to parameters like temperature, atmosphere, etc. etc. And with absorber with low work function where to produce anomic contact here is quite easy. The advantage is you have a lot of freedom to design your PN junction because the absorber was already synthesized when you start to build your junction. Um, is compatible with almost any kind of substrate, so you don't need specifically a transparent substrate because you are illuminating in that way. The disadvantage is you have few choices for metallic contacts that can withstand the temperatures and the conditions for synthesizing the absorber, and finally you need a better protection of the PN junction because the PN junction is closer to the atmosphere. But at the end, all of these compounds are very related. So you think that silicon is one thing, cattelluri another, sages another, but not at all. All of them become from the same structure and are structurally very well related. I think that Susan will speak a lot about this tomorrow. But as you can see here, if you take the silicon structure and we substitute one silicon atom by cadmium, another by tellurium, we <coughs> build this cadmium telluride structure. And if in the cadmium telluride structure we take two blocks, two uh, fundamental lattice, and we substitute one cadmium by indium and one cadmium by uh, copper and the tellurium by selenium, then we reconstruct the copper indium diselenide structure. The same here, if we take out one indium and substitute for zinc, one indium substitute for tin, we have the castorite structure. So at the end, all of these are really related by the structure. And this ensure or increase the probability to have very good optical or very similar optical and electrical properties. And we know that silicon is a very nice material in the, from the optoelectronic point of view, so we are creating uh, materials that are related to this cubic structure that has proven to be very, very useful for all the old optoelectronic um, application. So, more concretely, to better understand this, we can really play with the, um, uh, with the periodic table. And if we start with the silicon, then once again, if we move forward, one left and one hand, and one right, sorry, in the periodic table, substituting one silicon by gallium and another silicon atom by arsenicon, we have a gallium arsenide, another very powerful and very nice photovoltaic material. If we move once again, one left and one right, and substitute gallium by cadmium, arsenicon by tellurium, we have cataluri. If we keep constant this column and we start to substitute cadmium, one left and one right, one cadmium by copper, one cadmium by indium, and tellurium by selenium is in the same column. We have copper indium diselenide. And finally, if we keep constant copper and selenium, and we move one left and one right uh, indium, we have tin and we have um, uh, zinc, and we form then the castorite. So, of course, this, this, and this have cubic structure, this has tetragonal structure. So let's review some generalities of thin field photovoltaic technologies. So what are the general materials demands to build a thin field photovoltaic solar cell?
first, as I told you before, we always need a substrate. Hmm? And this substrate is the very beginning always of our solar cells. It's the first part of our solar cell where we start to build our solar cell. In particular, the good things of this technology is that the substrate can have special properties like transparency, flexibility that are not so common for silicon. And also, of course, one of the requirements is that high electronic quality layers can be deposited on this substrate. That has to be compatible with high electronic quality layers. But even though this allows for cost reduction, because we are using cheap material, we are substituting 300 microns of silicon for 3 millimeters of glass. And of course, glass is much, much, much cheaper than silicon. So our substrate right now is really a cheap material. And what we can do is also customize the materials of our substrate. And this opens a lot of possible application for thin field photovoltaic. We can use glass, we can use polymers, we can use metals, we can use everything you can imagine. The only one condition is that we stand the conditions required to have high quality layers on top of this substrate. Then on top of this substrate, normally we have to deposit our absorber. And the good thing of the thin field photovoltaic technologies is that you can select among, I don't know, hundreds of different methodologies, physical or chemical methodologies. So all of them have been applied and are useful for thin film deposition. And this is really very nice because depending on the nature of your material, you can choose one or another. In crystalline silicon, you have uh, almost two ways to prepare wafers and no more. And you can have a fine tuning of the electric optical properties with this kind of different deposition and also, of course, low deposition temperatures. Normally, between 300, 350 for some new materials up to 550, 600 degrees uh, for CGS or CDG. I don't know if it, this is my phone interfering. Solve it. Then the use of lower deposition temperature allow for cost reduction, lower energy consumption, and adaptation to the different substrate because we are working at lower temperature. And finally, we need that the absorber fulfill some, uh, some standard. Then absorber quality, we need high absorption coefficient and excellent electric and transport charge properties. And thanks to the very high absorption coefficient, we can use low amount of material, and this implies a cost reduction, and are compatible with a special application because using this on this kind of substrate or this type of substrate, we can convert our devices into transparent, semi-transparent, flexible, and all of this is almost impossible for silicon. Another advantage of uh, the thin field photovoltaic technology is that, of course, you cannot produce a single cell of one square meter. It's impossible because the series resistance of your uh, metallic layers of the TCO you need to connect will kill your device. So for that, the people invent time ago this series interconnection, call it normally the P1, P2, P3 interconnection. So basically it's a strategy to design normally very thin cells of one centimeter width or two centimeter width maximum, very long, one meter can be, and then interconnect them in series. Then you have a increase in the voltage, you are adding the voltage, and you keep the current constant among all of them. Then this ensures that the series resistance of your layer is not really relevant in, uh, during the operation of your solar module, mm? and also permit to choosing the thickness of your cell, the number of cells you connect, really, to have the power that you need for different applications. So it's useful in, in both ways. And this is one of the main advantages. You, uh, you cannot have one square meter single cell 
of uh, of a thin film uh, photovoltaic material so imagine if this is a solar panel you cannot have a single cell here because normally you have you can imagine how much current can produce one square meter so are a lot of amperes and you have to connect amperes a lot of amperes tens of amperes in a 500 nanometer thick TCO so it's impossible so you need to reduce this as much as possible and one centimeter, two centimeter is still okay. Then with this strategy you can connect all this cell and then you increase the voltage but you keep the current in a safe value that the TCO can afford. And these are examples of modules. So you can take a look like from the point of aesthetic point of view, say yes, and cut tellurized solar cells looks much more homogeneous than silicon, and this is nice from the aesthetic point of view, but also are fully compatible with flexible, with semi-transparent, and this open really a plethora of possible application with these materials. This is once again one of the advantages, for example, these strips are the single solar cells that are connected, if some of the part of your module is shadowed, for example, for a leaf, then in that case will not impact too much because really you are just shadowing a very small part of this, your very long solar cell. In the case of silicon, this will be a square like this and you will almost kill one of the cells that are typical from silicon. For example, here you can see actually silicon are several solar cells interconnected. So if you put a leaf here, you can kill one of these, then the performance of your whole panel will go down. In the case of SAGES or CDTA, this shadowing effect will be much less important. So let's start with the first of these materials, Cattellurai. I will not uh, speak about amorphous silicon because I never worked on amorphous silicon and it's not my business, so I can barely speak about them. So this is the evolution of the efficiency of Cattellurai with the time, in this famous efficiency chart from NREL. So for Cattellurai, take 40 years to go from 8% to 22% efficiency. And during 20 years, this material was almost dead because the record efficiency was almost constant here in 16%. So I remember, I don't know, eight, ten years ago when the people, when you attend some, uh, of, uh, some conference in photovoltaics, normally the people working in Cartelluri were really very few people and we look at them and you are very strange why working <laughs> in this material that after long long time the efficiency was almost unchanged but fortunately some key discovery that I will describe for you very soon allow the technology to increase the efficiency very fastly and this is the typical behavior of the photovoltaic material excepting of course perovskites the rest of the normal technologies normally keep constant for a while, someone discovers something important and blah, the efficiency jump. Then for some time it's still constant and someone discovers something important and in a few years, wow, a lot of progresses. And then the same again. Hmm? This is the typical behavior of all of them, I will show you after a while. Then there were three key discoveries in this technology to explain the increase on time ohmic contacts, cadmium chloride treatment, and the inclusion of selenium in the structure. This is the structure of Cataluri, it's a cubic structure, as you can see, it's a single blend structure, belong to the two six semiconductors family, that is technologically a very important family. And uh, normally in the family you have cat sulfide, cat selenide, and Cataluri and Cataluri in terms of bang up is the best suited for photovoltaic application so it's for that that we are using Cataluri and no the other and cadmium telluride is the optimum one in terms of, of bang up then to build once again or here in more detail uh, cadmium telluride solar cell 
you uh, start with your glass substrate. This is a very special glass substrate, iron free, because it has to be very transparent in that case. Then you deposit a front contact. That the two standard one are cadmium, tin oxide, or FTO. This is the thickness range that you can find in the literature. Then you passivate, you sorry, include a second layer that is zinc tin oxide or tin oxide normally. And then the N type partner of cateluri. Remember that we always work with P type semiconductors as absorbers because we are extremely good doing solar cells using a p-type absorber and then selective contacts for this p-type absorber but extremely bad in the opposite way. And you deposit cat sulfide around 70 to 100 nanometers and then the cat telluride absorber between 3 to 5 microns. Normally the people right now is using 3 microns. And then you finish with the top contact that used to be copper gold or mercurium telluride with copper telluride or zinc telluride with copper. You have different choices because this is the most complicated part of the, of the device. The work function of cadmium telluride is extremely high, so there are few materials that can really not block the current when you collect uh, here. Hmm? Mm -hmm. uh, on the back side, uh, a nanic contact on the front side, there is this detail junction with the cadmium sulfide. Yeah. But what is the, the role of the tin oxide? This one? Yes. There are, it's always the problem that cadmium sulfide and selenide is deposited normally, in, it's very thin and used to be quite amorphous material because it's a relatively low temperature that the people deposit it or need to be deposited. Then you have a lot of pinholes and one of the reasons is to try to insulate this pinhole if not you can shunt your TCO with your absorber this is one of the main reasons yeah and then also have some impact in, uh, in the band alignment it's much better if it's much smooth band alignment in this uh, structure then you have less recombination normally if you, if you contact directly this with this it's basically protecting and improve the band alignment in your structure. I have another question. Uh, Cadmium sulfide is an amorphous material, but contrary to CIGS, it's not detected at the end of the process, yeah. before the cannon terrorize, and which is probably deposited at quite high temperature. Yeah. So does it stay amorphous? No, no, no. Crystallize yeah. quite a lot yeah. and diffuse as well. You make some diffusion here of sulfur and now with selenium. So basically, selenium is doing some front graded bang up like in SageS, sulfur, or gallium. And this was the second or the third important discovery to improve the efficiency of, of these devices. But not improve a lot. But the problem is that you start from kind of amorphous material that you start to compact. So the probability to create pinholes during this crystallization during the growth of cattelura is quite high. You're welcome. So which processes we need for cartellurized solar cells for the material synthesis? First, this is a general recommendation. When you start to look for a new material, so always go first to the phase diagram. Because the phase diagram could be your best friend or your worst enemy if you don't take a look before. And in the cartellurized, we are very lucky because it evaporates congruently in the stoichiometry relationship of atoms and also sublimate with the correct stoichiometry. So we can apply evaporation. That is the simplest, the beautiful technique. It's very cheap, and this is one of the main advantages of cataluri. So the process used in labs and also in the industry for producing cataluri is called close space sublimation. And these are the characteristics. I will shall review very briefly after a while with some images. But normally you use some relatively uh, 550 degrees for the substrate, 700 degrees for evaporating the cadmium telluride source. And it's a very fast process, few minutes. And this is key also for low cost because it's a very low cost technique. But then you need a material activation process. Cat telluride by itself, if grown by this 
evaporation process is not as good as if you activate it with cadmium telluride. So this is a thermal, further thermal treatment that normally these are the conditions that you can find in the literature and this allow for a very high efficiency. This cadmium chloride treatment that was one of the main discoveries, this discoveries to, to improve the efficiency in cadmium telluride. These are the typical closed space sublimation equipment. You can see different diagrams and so on. Normally here is the substrate between two graphite blocks and some quartz walls here. So normally this distance right now is around one centimeter and you have lamps for a very fast and uh, uh, heating and you can have a really a very large difference of temperature between the substrate is here sorry the substrate at 550 and the cadmium telluride source at one centimeter distance 700 degrees. These are typical thin film solar cells made with cut telluride you can see very big and nice crystals with the typical all the layers required for, for, the, for, uh, uh, for an efficient solar cell. And basically describing, summarizing the production of cut telluride, so you start with just substrate with the, the FTO for example, then you sputter zinc tin oxide and cut sulfide, and then you increase immediately the temperature to deposit the cut to, uh, cadmium telluride. Then you reduce a bit the temperature for the cadmium chloride treatment, further reduce for the sputter of zinc telluride copper um, uh, contact, and then you sputter some metal to improve this conduction, normally aluminium can be used, and then it's done. And this is a very fast and cheap process. And the final improvement of cat telluride was thanks to the inclusion of cat, cel cat selenide and arsenicum doping in this material. Basically, they include some cadmium selenide telluride formation here that improve a lot the collection and reduce recombination uh, because increased current concentration toward the junction and they really boost efficiency using this selenium treatment together with this arsenical uh, doping. This is relatively secret process because it was developed by First Solar, that is a company so they don't really display too many details about this. Copper in your gallium the selenide. Yeah. Can you comment a little bit on the zinc and telluride uh, material and there's an heterostructure between the cadmium telluride and the zinc telluride? Here, this is the back contact. Yeah. So normally, zinc, hmm? yeah, but with lower work function. So normally what they do is to diffuse a bit, so you have uh, some evolution from cadmium telluride to cadmium zinc telluride, so this kind of ternary compound, and then zinc telluride. And this is a gradual bang up change, and in zinc telluride it's easier to prepare uh, uh, aomic contact than in cat telluride. It's like the molybdenum selenide for CIG, CIGS. Uh, I'm not sure, but it could be. It could be. It could be also kind of electron reflector for. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder from your opinion to measure paper transportation and flow space supplementation. Which one would be more easy to combine? From your purpose. I love this methodology, basically, vapor transport method, I think could be nice, but this is uh, extremely <coughs> easy methodology and it's quite reliable. So. Even uh, there are people electrodepositing cat telluride uh, made by sputtering and so on, but this, uh, I think this is a beautiful and very simple methodology. And even if vapor transport method is okay and it's nice, 
I see that this has the advantage to be very cheap and fast. So actually you can, I think you can achieve 20% with some methods without problems, like say JS, for sputtering, for electro deposition, for co-evaporation, you have similar level of efficiency. And after Yeah, 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 because you have very close the source and the substrate. And it's an extremely fast process. I think that it's easier in this case. If Solar Frontier is using this methodology, it's because for sure, yeah. For sure they tried many things that we don't know. This 20 years that the people was neglecting Cateluride, they were working in all these things. And if they choose this, it's because for sure it's easy. Sorry. The ternary compounds? Here, you mean? Here create a graded bang up, like in a like in SageS. So you increase the bang up here normally, then you reduce the whole concentration and you reduce recombination there, a lot of recombination. And then in somehow also your surface has a higher bang up and it's in quite a lot of extent determining your POC. Then it's like if you are using a wider bang up material with higher POC. So you are increasing your VOC without sacrificing the current because the material is still 1.5 here in the bulk and you are absorbing all the light very efficiently. So it's exactly the same in SageS. Just a small question. You say it's a fast process, can you use some oil of magnitude? For cadmium telluride deposition it's 5 minutes maximum. Mm -hmm. It's extremely fast. It's extremely fast. So, say yes, once again, for some time increase, then stay constant, they an increase, they stay constant, they then an increase. So, same history than in Cartelluride. And with only three key discoveries, I will explain you how to improve a say yes solar cell. So, this is the crystal structure of say yes becomes from the chalcoparite family where you have copper and gallium or copper and union planes then uh, separated by the halogen plane by the calcogen plane sorry either sulfur and selenium and same again but you can have different polytypes different uh, structure like the copper gold here in this case gallium and copper are sharing the same planes in this case copper is in one plane then the chalcogen then gallium then the chalcogen then copper Okay, and these two materials can have very different properties, even just for exchanging the atoms. This is the band structure of SageS, and we, what we can see is in all this family, we can have from copper indium diselenide to sulfide, 5 and with gallium concentration, with aluminium, sorry, uh, included in them. And taking a look in all of them in the band structure, we can see that the conduction band is controlled by indium and the valence band by copper. So this means if you touch copper or indium in your structure, changing it by another element, reducing the quantity in your structure and so on, you can modify your valence band or your conduction band. And with all this family of material, we can go from one electron volt to 3.5 electron volt. So the open, this opens a lot of different possibilities for for application and there are several of this material that have the right bang up for solar cell application. So it's not just one material, it's really a family of material. Of course the absorption of all this material is extremely good and all of them have <coughs> direct bang up. So we need very thin absorbers like 1, 1.5 microns is more than enough and normally the solid solution of the copper, indium, gallium, diselenide. This is the case that works very well for all of 
possible combination follow relatively linear um, correlation from the composition with the bang up with some bowing effect but it's not so relevant as you can see so you can control quite well the bang up you want and all these um, uh, materials are really possible in all the possible compositions they have uh, excellent visibility of course are much more complex than cataluri so then now all the type of defects uh, start to be very relevant and in particular in chalcopyrites we can have different type of defects like vacancies so one atom is missing in the structure anti-sites so these atoms really exchange their place or even interstitials so some atom is in one place that is not a lattice place so here you have summary of all type of defects you can have among all of them copper vacancies used to be the most stable one or the the one that requires less energy to be formed and can explain also the p-type conductivity um, of these materials but this material is even more complex and you can have different pair defects or complex defects like this is a non-disturbed lattice of CJS but if you change here indium by copper and copper by indium then you have this kind of cluster that have low energy formation and can ha introduce disorder in the material and you can have this kind of periodic also complexes with uh, co two copper vacancies and one co indium on copper anti-site then you create a complex like this that are non-stoichiometric uh, defects and can form cluster of new different phases and this is the case if you take a look to the uh, formation diagram of all these possible compounds basically forming this type of cluster and propagating them we can have new type of compounds like copperinium 5 selenium 8 copperinium 3 selenium 5 so this means if we add one atom we don't have 33% more of complexity we really really have order of magnitude of complexity of more complexity in this material and you can form at the same time to chalcopyrite all these compounds that have different bang ups and also some of them have anti-conductivity these are called the OVC ordered vacancy compounds are quite specific to chalcopyrite and I will show you that sometimes can be even good for the material, not bad. Also, CJS use cut sulfide as selective contact for electrons because in particular with copper indium diselenide the band alignment is perfect. It's very good for electron transfer and really block holes in this uh, uh, heteroshunction. So it's the perfect partner that uh, everyone is almost using and some or although some uh, groups and uh, one of the companies Solar Frontier have developed a cadmium free buffer layer that used to work as good as cat sulfide but normally all the people use cat sulfide and after this generalities of this technology normally this material exhibit three efficiency jump, jumps in the, in the history the first one was thanks to the sodium doping. The second one for the discovery of the gallium alloying for graded bang up, and then the third one, the alkali PDT with heavy alkalis. So sodium doping, this is a very nice example of an accident in a lab because someone changed the typical borosilicate glass that uh, were used at that time in CJS for a soda, for a cheaper soda lime glass and they observed that the CJS grown onto soda lime glass performed much better than the previous borosilicate. So they start to look as crazy about why just changing the substrate we have such nice effects and was basically thanks to the doping with sodium. So sodium start to be very relevant for this technology and basically we can introduce sodium right now in four different ways. Frame first 
as was discovered naturally from the substrate. We use some substrate like soda lime glass containing sodium during the synthesis of the material we diffuse toward the absorber. Then using back contacts doped with sodium like molybdenum doped with sodium and will diffuse during the synthesis of the absorber. Or we can use the method called pre-absorber synthesis, depositing some sodium containing layer on top of our back contact mm -hmm. and diffusing it during the synthesis. And finally, we can first synthesize our absorber, then deposit some layer containing sodium and diffuse it in a further thermal treatment. These are the four methodologies and all of them works very well. Really, there's this kind of universal. You need sodium, doesn't matter how to introduce it. You can see some of the effect of sodium, larger grains because create some flux for crystallization. And one of the characteristics is that sodium tends to be accumulated at the interfaces. This is one of the reasons is because sodium loves oxygen. So where oxygen is, sodium will diffuse naturally. And also one of the most important effects of sodium is that it's able to control the electrical conductivity of your, of your uh, layer. So can really modify your carrier concentration. In principle, sodium goes to the copper position and sodium and copper are isoelectronic elements. Then why sodium increase the carrier concentration if are isoelectronic? And the reason was solved some years ago where some group demonstrate that basically when you cr synthesize your material, sodium occupy uh, copper position and during the cooling down process, because sodium is not anymore um, uh, soluble in the CGS, then diffuse toward the interfaces, but leaving a lot of copper vacancies. So what is doing sodium is helping to create copper vacancies to control the pitai conductivity. The second important effect of, uh, for increase the efficiency of CJS is the gallium alloying. So you can try to introduce gallium. Gallium compounds has, have a um, wider band gap at the front, at the back, and all the combinations possible. And some of them you can win even up to 4% efficiency. And this is the typical grading that is used in CJS. It's more or a wider bang up at the interface with the cut sulfide and a bit wider bang up at the interface with the back contact. And this works very well and in this technology can be achieved by gallium back and front grading. So more gallium at the back and more, more gallium at the back and more gallium at the front. Or gallium with indium and sulfur and selenium. More gallium at the back, more sulfur at the front. And both of them work very well. To achieve gallium gallium graded bang up, the three stage co evaporation process is the best one. Because during the co evaporation of copper indium gallium diselenide, basically you split your process in three stages. In the first stage, you introduce only indium and gallium. In the second stage, you start to introduce copper until rich copper rich condition. Then you stop copper and once again introduce indium and gallium until reach uh, copper poor conditions. And normally you keep gallium rich at the back, gallium poor on, uh, on in the middle, and gallium rich once again in the top. These are examples of typical co-evaporation system for CJS at uh, industrial scale, at lab scale, and this is uh, the typical schema of this co-evaporation process where you need copper, indium and gallium uh, evaporators and selenium cracker normally. <coughs> and this is the other process used for ga uh, grading in CJS is using sulfur. So basically gallium is kept as the back contact for bang up grading but then you introduce a step where you sulfurize your surface then you increase the bang up of your surface with sulfur instead of gallium. This is the methodology used by Solar Frontier, by the main company in the world producing CJS, and also works extremely well. Here you can see the gallium increase at the back and the sulfur increase at the front for creating both gratings. 
And the last progress was thanks to the alkali PDT process, basically to treat the surface with a heavy alkali element. So this was one of the first reports on this, where they show, in this case, uh, between EMPA and SW in Germany, how using this potassium, rubidium, and cesium treatment of the surface of the SAGES, the efficiency can be really boosted. The reason is because even if it's still under study and under discussion, induced surface modification, basically copper and gallium depletion. And this facilitates cadmium diffusion from cadmium sulfide and create a much better junction and improve the diode quality. This is, for example, what happened with some PDT. Normally what you do is to uh, move your uh, uh, balance band downwards, then this reduces the whole concentration in European junction and then reduce recombination as well in European junction. This is one of the theories followed for explaining the effect of uh, potassium uh, rubidium and cesium fluoride PDT. But it's extremely complex and the people is still debating about what happened because it seems that also potassium, rubidium and cesium are forming compounds like potassium indium selenide or rubidium indium selenide that can play really a role on that. But this is a very important step if you are working in CGS in order to get efficiencies over 20%. And this is one of the last records presented on over 22% efficiency. I thought the record right now is 23.3 by Solar Frontier. And finally, Kesterite and beyond. You can imagine if introducing one extra element was crazy in the case of SAGES. When I saw for the first time this uh, structure, I became crazy because it's really a complex uh, structure. So you have copper, zinc, and tin. And can you tell me what kind of peculiarities can you see in this uh, structure? Probably not because there are a lot. Because all these elements introduce a peculiarity in this uh, structure. In particular, copper and zinc are isoelectronic and are sharing the same lattice plane. So they can very easily exchange in this plane and introduce disorder. This is one of the main problems. Tin. Tin has a lot of problems associated to them. First, tend to form volatile species with selenium and sulfur. So to keep tin in your layer can be extremely challenging. Tin is a multivalent element. To stabilize the valence of tin in your, um, in your structure can be a nightmare. Tin also strongly interacts with the alkaline elements. So if you have tin and sodium, tin and potassium, then you have strange interaction in your lattice that for every different quantity of tin you include, and also depending on your process, you need really to very adjust your sodium concentration. Zinc is the less problematic one in this term, just with the consideration of the isoelectronic uh, properties with copper. This is the typical structure of a CCTS solar cell, and it's the same than SAGES. Why? Because during 10 years we were trying to modify this structure and adapt to the Kesterite, and during the 10 years we failed. <laughs> And we are with the same structure that at the very beginning, in right now, we really found that the problem for the moment is not the structure, it's the material itself. <laughs> so these are some of the best devices reported in literature. The good thing is that five years ago, only a few groups in the world can achieve 10, 11, 12 percent. Right now, there are 20, 30 groups in the world that can achieve this efficiency. And this is very uh, critical mass that I think in the future can help to really discover what is the process that we need to activate Kesterite. These are the reference for your... So just to use show you briefly, in terms of back contact, believe me, we tried anything you can imagine, anything. And nothing works better than molybdenum. So I can show you 
hundreds of examples in the literature about substitution of molybdenum in a, say, in CSATS by another contact in order to improve the back contact properties, but all of them fails. So molybdenum is still the best option for this technology. But even if we take a look to our back contact, we observe a lot of voids in our back contact. And the reasons are mainly these three, in order of magnitude. The volatility of tin selenide species are the main problem. Then the formation of some tin selenide liquid phase that cannot wet very well the substrate, and a fast copper out diffusion during the the synthesis, but this is the main one, the tin selenide or tin sulfide volatility. And of course you have a deterioration of the field factor and in extreme cases you even can observe deterioration in the GAC because this absorber here has not the same thickness that this here or this here. This is maybe, I don't know, 1.1 micron, this is 1.5 micron in this, uh, in this place, so you can have really absorption losses. But we are working on improving that, and since that there are strategies to ch ch uh, change from this to this, that looks a bit better. It's not the end, but managing the type of precursors we are using, I will not enter into technical details because they're really boring. If someone is working on Kesterite and is interested, I will be very happy to discuss with you how to improve or start to improve your back contact. But basically this is something that we are working to solve, we are increasing a bit the field factor, but of course it's not the final solution for Kesterite. The same for the front contact. Once again, believe me, we tried anything you can imagine, any kind of etching, any kind of buffer layer, any kind of passivating layer you can imagine on top of the Kesterite. We is not only IREC, the Kesterite community, I guess. All the people that we are working on Kesterite. And we always fail. And cut sulfide still is the best. In terms of vinyl alignment, with the selenide compound, the vinyl alignment is perfect. With the sulfide, you have some small cliff, but it's really a small. Then cannot explain the large VOC deficit of this material. So still cut sulfide, probably for the sulfur compound is not the best, but for the moment, it's not the big issue. What we observe is studying the front interface, but the special TEM analysis that we really sputter from the substrate, all the material, and we observe the surface. Okay, I will accelerate. It's just the end part. So we observe a lot of defects, linear defects and point defects at the surface of CCTS. And all these defects, of course, can be dislocation or some subgrain boundaries. All this, this is the surface of the kesterite, and are periodic or even punctual defects, point defects, that can explain how bad is the surface of kesterite, because the composition and the properties of the surface of this material is very different than the one of bulk material. So in IREC, we start to think, okay, we will grow a very thick layer, and then we will remove the surface by etching. And what we observe is that we have a lo lot of impact then removing different parts of this absorber, reducing the thickness. Any time we were studying the surface by Raman spectroscopy in this case, what we observe is that the defects evolve towards the back. And the surface is extremely defective and with a lot of secondary phases. So probably removing the surface, we can improve the quality of our devices. We are now working in preparing devices with this methodology. The problem we have right now is that we create also a lot of pinholes and the solar cells are uh, shunted, but we are improving this in order to prove that removing the surface at least you can improve a bit the uh, device's properties. And finally, the absorber. As I told you before, all these problems become from the composition of Kesterite but you have also complex interfaces and a large number of defects, deep defects associated to tin, high non-radiative recombination, and very low carrier lifetime characterized kesterite. All bad properties for solar cell. And a large VOC deficit, deficit and deficiency is still at 13% level. But 
In the Star Cell project, that was the biggest project in this material in Europe, the biggest initiative, very recently and just at the end of the project, the group of Aaron Walsh that was included in Star Cell proposed that team related defects can be at the origin of all these wrong properties of, of uh, uh, Kestrite. Basically, because the team related anti side defects introduce deep defects that are GN recombination traps. So we need to avoid this kind of defects. And to do that, we have some technological solution. Work in zinc rich condition in order to avoid this, but this form zinc sulfide, zinc telenide secondary phases and are detrimental. Work in tin poor condition, but then we have copper rich secondary phases that are conductive and kill our devices. Or finally, work with whole poor material like anti-material, but this material has a lot of acceptors. It's extremely complex to dop and type the kestorite. So these are not technological solutions, and we are now working in two possible uh, strategies. First, remove tin and work with germanium that is more stable, with quite nice results for the moment, and then introduce hydrogen doping. That hydrogen doping basically will remove free electron from your material and reduce recombination. In terms of germanium, we are working a lot and we prove that Normally, the introduction of germanium makes your life easy in this material, and normally we get better efficiencies and still some proof for uh, less recombination with uh, this uh, germanium alone. And with hydrogen, the problem is it's extremely difficult to dock with hydrogen. And hydrogen is a highly mobile species and it's very difficult to stabilize. So this topic is very interesting and we are starting to introduce some strategies to try to prove that with hydrogen doping it could be possible to improve kesterite. Although we have some evidences in the literature because some of the most efficiencies, efficient devices on kesterite were doped with lithium and lithium is very similar to, to hydrogen. So the introduction of lithium can in somehow be similar to the introduction of hydrogen. Well, I will jump this. This is new materials, doesn't matter. And finally, the sum up is that thin film photovoltaics are really complementary technologies to crystalline silicon because they can be applied in some applications that are unaffordable for silicon. Current major technologies are cateluri and coperinium gallium deselenide that are at the market. You can are the market. You can buy modules of cateluri and say yes. The production costs and durability are comparable to silicon, the payback time is lower, the conversion efficiency are still 3-4% lower but improving and the main challenge, challenge of these technologies are related to the use of indium, gallium and tellurium that are scarce material. And this explains why we are insisting a lot on kesterite and new materials, because we need new materials that are free of critical raw elements. Finally, I would like to thank to the European project that are funding <coughs> these activities and, of course, the organizers for this very nice invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edgardo, for the very nice interview. Um, we'll take just one or two very quick questions if you have. Yes. I have one, I don't know if it's quick. I mean, my question is quick, you answer. Uh, you, you, <laughs> uh, you mentioned a lot about the CZTS, it's very interesting matter for many reasons, and that there is still this UOC deficit. And in your presentation, I didn't see a lot.